Right, okay, so if we could open our Bibles to 1 John, uh, chapter 1. And as I said, it's been a few months since we've been here, so I'll just reread the, the opening passage and then we'll just work our way through these opening chapters. So, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Okay, so it's important to establish up front the purpose of the book. Uh, and the overriding purpose of the book is the theme of fellowship, fellowship with God. So 1 John is written to believers. It's not written to explain to them the way of salvation, but rather it's written to those who are already saved. Uh, it's explaining how to stay in fellowship and as a result to grow. So John's gospel is written as a gospel tract. It's written with the primary purpose of evangelism, whereas 1 John is written as the primary purpose of fellowship and growth. Uh, we also see that in the opening verse, this word we is used three times, as well as the word our being used once. And so this strongly implies that John is writing on behalf of a group, um, or at least he's including himself in it as part of a group. And there are times in this epistle that John seems to be writing on behalf of an apostolic group, and he uses the word we instead of the word I to do that. And then we also see in verses three to four that the, as, as we've said, the purpose is that these believers would have joy through fellowship with God. And so the book, again, is not about testing the truthfulness of a person's salvation, uh, as salvation cannot be lost, uh, but a person's joy can be. And so it's a test of whether or not we have joy through fellowship uh, at, the, at the moment. So this epistle is one that kind of flows quite nicely from section to section. And so if we pick up in verse five, it says, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. But from this section, really up until the end of chapter two, verse two, it's an introductory passage about the effect of sin on fellowship with God. So firstly, in verse five, we have a declaration about the character of God. We are told that God is light. There are lots of statements of this kind of sort in this epistle. And because God is light, there is no darkness in him at all. And so the following verses explains what happens to us when we walk in or we practice darkness. Because God is light, he is holy and pure. And so according to verse six, if we say that we have fellowship with him, but walk in darkness, then we lie because darkness and light cannot have fellowship. And from verses six to ten, we have five if statements. Um, and these are what we call the third class conditional statements, which means these could be true, but they also could not be true. So in other words, a Christian could say that they have fellowship with God whilst working in, walk, walking in darkness. Or in verse seven, we might walk in light or we might not walk in light. In verse eight, it's possible for us to say we have no sin, it's, but we might not say that and, and so on. So. Christians can walk in darkness. Christians can be out of fellowship of God, with God, but they also might not be. And so it's important as well to note that John uses the word we, if we say in verse six, but if we walk in verse seven, if we say in verse eight. So he's including himself, the apostolic group, as well as his readers in this we. And so he's identifying with his readers, which shows it's possible for them and him as well to be walking in darkness so if it's possible for them and possible for john to potentially be at a fellowship with god it is also possible for us um, some apply these verses to salvation and they would say that walking in darkness is describing an unsaved person or they might say that walking in darkness is habitual sin and that if a person is practicing habitual sin then they're not a true believer uh, the problem with that view is that we all sin daily, and so in that regard at least, we can all be said to, to have habitual compulsive sin in our lives. Uh, the problem is that fellowship is not synonymous with salvation. Uh, 
And so as part of this series, we did a specific message that examined other verses in the New Testament that describe fellowship. We looked at it as a standalone thing. Fellowship relates to intimacy or the quality or the closeness that we have with the Lord. It's not about position. It's about condition. So we are justified by faith alone, and that leads us to position, being eternally secure. But fellowship with God affects our condition. You know, a saved person is positionally in Christ. They're justified, they're heaven bound, but the condition of their lives could potentially be an utter mess. Um, and I think Lot is probably the best biblical example of that. Verse seven of chapter one, um, says that by walking in light, we have fellowship with God and that Christ's blood cleanses us uh, from all sin. Uh, this is similar to the account in John 13, where Christ washes the disciples' feet. So Christ declared that his disciples were clean through the word that he had spoken. But he also said that their, their feet needed cleaning. The rest of them didn't. When Peter said, like, wash the rest of me, he said no. Uh, because although they were clean or saved, as they walked through life, they accumulated dirt and, and this was done physically on their feet. But there was a spiritual lesson that was being taught as well. The need, the need for regular cleansing. Verses 6, 8 and 10. Um, they all refute certain claims that can possibly be made by Christians. So verse 6 refutes the idea that Christians cannot be carnal. Or that Christians cannot walk in and practice sin because it is possible verse 8 refutes the idea that we have no sin there are people out there that teach that christians uh, once you're saved you will never sin again but verse 8 refutes that idea and then verse 10 refutes the idea <clears throat> that we have not sinned uh, there is a, a slight different emphasis in those two verses so i see verse 8 as relating more to our nature by if we say that we have no sin it's like saying we have no sin nature Whereas verse 10 speaks more of actions, sinned is something that you've done. So the Christian cannot claim sinless perfection in either nature or in deeds. So if once we were saved, we no longer sin or we no longer have no sin in us, if sinless perfection was true, then verse 9 would be a completely pointless verse. And so would chapter 2 verse 1. Uh, these two verses are written so that we know what to do when we do inevitably sin. So verse 9 is a key verse. It speaks of confession of sin. And confess simply means to admit guilt. So our sin is forgiven based upon the character of Christ, who in this verse is called faithful and just. The word cleanse is here again, which indicates that this is not a salvation verse. But a restoration of fellowship verse and so when we sin when we are out of fellowship with the lord we can confess those sins and based upon the character of christ we'll be forgiven and we'll be restored to fellowship uh, chapter two and the opening two verses take this a bit further and they give us the legal reason that our sins can be forgiven so we're forgiven because of the character of christ but this forgiveness is not arbitrary he doesn't just forgive us like willy-nilly because of who he is but also because of what he's done the chapter opens with the exhortation not to sin. It says, uh, I write these things unto you that ye sin not. Uh, but then it goes on to say, and if any man sin, which again is a, a third class conditional, which means that we could sin um, or we might not sin. Uh, like Inevitably, we will sin. So it is possible for us to sin. Um, he's, he says this, the exhortation not to sin is there because it is better to stay in fellowship than to be restored to fellowship. Yes, when we're out of fellowship, we can confess and be restored immediately, but it's better to not need to do that in the first place, um, if that makes sense. But verse one, as we said, goes on to say, if any man sins, which includes the author as well. So John is applying this to himself as much as to his readers. So it's possible for an apostle to sin. And if that's the case, it is definitely possible for us too. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father who is Jesus Christ, the righteous. An advocate is someone who pleads on our behalf like a lawyer in court. And then verse 2 tells us that this is done on the basis of propitiation, that Christ himself is the propitiation. It says he is the propitiation for our sins. Probably the best English word 
to explain propitiation is satisfaction. And it really satisfies demands or it makes a payment. It satisfies the wrath of God towards sin. Um, a way that it could be said is if I was to tell Chloe to pick up all of her toys and then she picks up all of her toys, I could say to her, my demands have been propitiated or satisfied as it were. So the demands of a holy and righteous God have been propitiated or satisfied by Christ. Uh, we know that he's done this through the cross and it's on the basis of this one-time sacrifice that we are able to have continued restoration. Uh, when it comes to soteriology or the doctrine of salvation, most of the terms we think about are terms that relate to us. We think of justification. It relates to us that we're made just, that we are justified. Forgiveness, we are forgiven. Eternal life is a gift we receive. Regeneration is something that's done to us. Adoption is something that's done to us uh, on the basis of faith alone. Pro pro propitiation is different, different uh, in that its focus is on God, not on us. God is the one who is propitiated or the one who is satisfied. It's his demands in this case that have been met. We also see in chapter 2 and verse 2 that this propitiation was made not just for us. Um, it's not just for Christians, but also for the whole world. It is universal. This does not mean that the whole world is saved or even will be saved at some point. It's universal, but not universalist. Uh, and there's a key difference. Christ's death is payment enough to propitiate God's wrath against the sin of the whole world, against everyone who's ever lived. But sin is not the only issue. Just because God's wrath has been propitiated does not mean that sinful people have automatically been regenerated and justified. Um, there's an analogy. It's If we were to say that in order to get to heaven, you need to have a million pound in the bank. But the problem is that you are a million pound in debt. So on the cross, our sin debt gets imputed to Christ. So our debt is wiped out. Um, God's, God's demands in terms of our debt has been satisfied and propitiated. We're forgiven. We owe no debt, but we're still short of the million pound. Uh, we need his righteousness to be imputed to us. So we go from negative righteousness to positive righteousness. We're then in credit. Uh, we go to Christ's righteousness. So the death of Christ is for the sin of the whole world. The sin of the whole world is imputed to Christ and it makes salvation possible for all people. But Christ's righteousness and, and then justification, regeneration are only imputed to those uh, who come to Christ alone on the basis of faith alone. Some say that this phrase whole world only applies to the elect. Um, they say that world doesn't mean the whole world, but it means um, some out of every tribe, tongue, kindred, etc. So a selection of different people from the world. But in my view, this is just playing games with the text. If we just look down to verse 15 quickly, we see a simple phrase that says love not the world. It's cosmos in Greek, and that's the same word used here in John in 1 John 2 to um, cosmos. So obviously in verses 15 to 17, world means world, uh, and that's because of context. But the same is true in chapter 2, verse 2. Context is king again, and it's clearly the whole world, um, and they're a different group to Christians. Otherwise, we could paraphrase the verse this way. We could say he's the propitiation for our sins or for Christian sins. And not for ours, as in believers only, but also for the sins of believers, which just wouldn't really make sense. It's two different groups that are in view here. Um, our, as in believers, and the whole world, as in the rest of the world, specifically the unsaved world. As we move into verses 3 to 6, we're introduced to this idea of knowing God. Uh, this phrase was compared with... Uh, John chapter 14 and verse 9, where Jesus said to Philip, um, have you been with me so long, Philip, and yet you have not known me? Now, Philip had been saved for three years, and yet he he is said in that verse to not know Christ. Uh, this shows us that it's not a salvation reference in the Upper Room Discourse, but is related to spiritual growth, maturity and intimacy with Christ. And this is borne out by the fact that knowing God is proved by keeping his commandments. So if this is about initial salvation, if this is about um, getting saved and knowing God in that sense, then it's teaching a works-based salvation. 
Rather, as we grow in our knowledge of and our love for Christ, we will increasingly keep his commandments uh, and we will demonstrate that we have come to know God, that we've grown in our knowledge of him. So it's not a test of salvation, but a test of fellowship and maturity. Uh, verse 5 has this phrase, in him. And then verse 6 um, has this phrase, uh, "Who uh, he that saith he abideth in him. And so we're introduced for the first time to a key word, which is abide or abides or abideth, uh, which is from the Greek word meno. In previous studies, we compared this verse to the passage in John 15 verses 1 to 8. And in particular, in John 15, 7, we're told that we, if we abide in Christ, then his words abide in us. And so here in 1 John 2 verses 5 to 6, we see that abiding in Christ, being in him, is dependent upon keeping his word, which is the same as keeping his commandments, which is evidence that we know God. Thus we can conclude that abiding is a synonym for fellowship. So whereas 1 John 1 9 taught us how to get back into fellowship through confession of sin, we are now being told how to stay in fellowship, how to abide and to grow as a result of that abiding. Verses 7 to 11 teach us about the love of Christ and the love that we have towards our brother. Again, some say that if you don't love the brethren, then you aren't truly saved. But how can you hate your brother? According to verse 11, it says, he that hates his brother is in darkness. Um, if they're not really your brother, if that makes sense, how can you hate some? How can you hate your brother if they're not really your brother? You'd be hating a stranger. Um, and so... It's not about people that are false brothers, but rather it's demonstrating the fact, and, and this is true to life, that Christians can potentially hate one another. If we are not loving our fellow Christians, then quite simply, it's not that we're not saved, it's that we're not abiding in Christ, we're out of fellowship with the Lord. Uh, verses 12 to 14 um, describe to us in general three stages of spiritual growth. Uh, we've got infanthood, adolescence and adulthood. There's a progression demonstrated because, for instance, the Greek words used in verse 12 and 13 for little children are two different Greek words. So it's little children both times in English. Um, and the Greek words, the first one uh, refers more to a baby and the second one refers more to a, a toddler or we would say an infant. And so they're both little children in English, but the point is that there's some progress. So when we're first saved, our sins are forgiven. And so that's why in verse 12, it says, I write unto you little children because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. That's like a brand new believer, as it were. And then in verse 13, when it says, um, I write unto you little children, it says, because you have known the father. And so they've demonstrated at least some level of growth, some level of, of intimacy in getting to know the Lord. You know, it's been just over a year. Freddie, for instance, is like 14 months old. He's still a baby in many ways, but he's on that, he's in that bodler stage. He's not quite a toddler, but he's also not a baby anymore. Um, when he was a brand new baby, he didn't know anything. He didn't know who his daddy was, right? He didn't know who his father was. Um, granted, a brand new believer ought to know at least who their father is, but the point is, Freddie didn't know anything. He just knew how to smell for milk and cry when he wanted a cuddle or a nappy change, and that was about it. But 14 months later, he generally will respond to some verbal commands, and he knows who his mummy is and his daddy is and who his siblings are. So even though he's still a baby, he's grown in knowledge. And so I see um, that difference there between the two phrases of little children. Um, and that's kind of how it how it progresses. So there's, there's to be this progression in the spiritual life, little children, adolescence and adulthood. Uh, at the end of this, in verse 14, the young men are said to overcome the wicked one because the word of God abides in you and so if we again compared that to john 14 7 we would see that um the indwelling word is linked closely to prayer because the verse says if ye abide in me and my words abide in you ye shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you and so the abiding word of god is 
um, necessary for an effective prayer life, and um, which is necessary to overcome the wicked one. And so quite simply, to overcome the wicked one in terms of um, abiding and living a victorious Christian life, we need to be in the word and in prayer. And I guess it's that simple. That brings us really on to verse 15. And this could be seen as a direct admonition to the young men who have just overcome. Um, as, or it could be seen as an admonition to, to those who, who have not overcome. Uh, the phrase love not the wor world could be accurately rendered as stop loving the world. So we have this um, kind of contrast, as it were, between the love of the father and the love of the world. In this verse, you cannot be abiding in the love of the Father whilst also loving the things of the world. Um, so that's not to say that we can't enjoy ourselves or can't appreciate things in the world. But if a believer is overly infatuated and focused on and prioritising the things of this world system, then he is not abiding in Christ. And this, this reminds me of Demas. Uh, Demas was most likely a saved man. He was a minister with the Apostle Paul, but then at a later point he departed the ministry and it specifically says that he was in love with the present world. He was in love with the world system, which is exactly what Christians here are commanded not to be. An Old Testament example, as we've alluded to earlier, again is Lot, who was drawn to Sodom. He was clearly a saved individual, um, but he was drawn to Sodom. Verse 16 gives us a threefold manner of temptation it says the lust of the eyes the lust of the flesh and the pride of life it's interesting that eve was tempted in these three areas so with the lust of the flesh she saw that the fruit was good for food the lust of the eyes she saw that it was pleasant to look at and the pride of life in that the fruit was desirable to make one wise and so she took and gave some to her husband but christ in the wilderness was also tempted in these ways so with the lust of the flesh, Satan tempted him to turn stones into bread. With the lust of the eyes, he was shown the kingdoms of the whole world. And with the pride of life, he was tempted to throw himself down from the temple to make a spectacle of himself to prove he was the Messiah. But where Eve failed, Christ prevailed. And then verse 17 reminds us of the temporary nature of the world and its lusts. And that is why the account of Demas is so sad in that he loved this present world, which is passing away, more than he loved the world which is to come, which is eternal. And so as believers, we ought to be eternally focused. So in light of the fact that the world is passing away, we're reminded as we move on into verse 18, that it is the last hour. Um, and we're introduced here to Antichrist. So we're told that there are many Antichrists. Um, sorry, whilst there are many Antichrists, there is also one specific Antichrist who shall come. Um, the phrase shall come actually jumped out at me because it's a Greek verb that I've been studying. And so I didn't notice this this first time around. So this is a little bit of a tangent, but I kind of couldn't help myself from looking at it. Um, technically, there are seven Greek verb tenses. Um, so there is the present, the future, the imperfect, the perfect, the pluperfect, the aorist, and the second aorist. And the only difference between the aorist and the second aorist is uh, the spelling, uh, the way the word's written. So there's no functional difference. They work in exactly the same way. So really, it's six different tenses. So here we've got the word erkamai, which is the Greek word for come. And it's in the present infinitive. But it's speaking of a future coming. Uh, Revelation 3.10 also uses the word erkamai in the present tense when it says you will be kept from the hour that is about to come upon the earth. Uh, Matthew 9.15 is an example of erkamai in the future tense. It says but the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them and then they shall fast. So my point is, if something is future, whether that is something that's about to come or a long way off, the way to say that using this Greek verb is by either using the present or the future tense. However, if something has already happened or has started and is continuing, there is also a way to say that. 
So in John 20, 24, um, it reads, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So in English, that is in the past tense, but in Greek, there is no past tense. So Erkamai here is in the second aorist active infinitive. Uh, 1 Timothy 1.15 is the same Greek construction as this. And in English, it says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Christ Jesus came, past tense. Uh, Revelation 14.7 is the same. It says, the hour of his judgment is come. Uh, we could say, is here, has arrived. Um, and it's an interesting contrast to Revelation 3.10. They both use the same verb, but one's in the present infinitive, one's in the second aorist active infinitive, and one's looking forward and one's looking back. So the hour that Revelation 3.10 is speaking of has arrived at least by the point of Revelation 14.7. The controversial ver verse um, which this verb is kind of fought over is in Revelation 6.17. But again, it uses the second aorist active infinitive, which is consistently used in scripture to speak of an event that has already happened at some point in the past. Now, Erkamai is used 94 times in the aorist active indicative, and each of those times in the New Testament, it is used to denote an action that has happened at some point in the past. And so thus in Revelation 6.17, when the earth dwellers realise that the wrath of God has begun or has arrived or is come, uh, that's the correct translation. That, in fact, every English translation says has come or is come because it's something that has already arrived. Uh, and I know I've gone off on a tangent and I'm kind of hobby horse in this at the moment. And so I apologize for that. But there are rapture views that rely on this being a reference to something that is about to happen or is going to come shortly. But Erkamai in the aorist is never used of something future. And if it was something future, the present or the future tenses could have been used. So what I'm saying is that if it was something that was about to happen, there is a different way that it could have been said. Uh, and I know that this was a bit of a digression and it's not part of our original study, but I think at the moment it was something that's important to include and is relevant considering the verse that we find it in here is related to the Antichrist. Several months ago, we did a whole study on the Antichrist, and this is a term that is only ever used in John's epistles. So in Christianese or, or theological terms, it's become the main term that we use for the future satanic one world leader known as the beast. Antichrist is the most common name for him, like when we're discussing. Uh, however, um, a better or more accurate term would be the man of sin. So something I've considered recently, as in like in the last week or two, so very recently, and it's something I'm going to give more thought to, is whether or not the Antichrist and the man of sin is the same person. So let me just explain whether or not the Antichrist is a term that's better attributed to the false prophet, the second beast, rather than the first beast. So the Antichrist is certainly one of the beasts. The first beast is certainly the man of sin but it is the second beast that could be the Antichrist. And, and the reason I say this, uh, I'm not I'm not going to like die on, the, die on the hill over this, but the reason I say this is that John is the only one who uses the term Antichrist or Antichrists in his epistles. It's not used outside of those. And he uses it of those who are deceivers and false teachers. A careful reading of Revelation 13 will show that it is the second beast that deceives those who dwell on the whole earth. Revelation 13, 14 is the first mention of deception in that chapter, and it is attributed to the activity of the second beast. And then even in 2 Thessalonians 2, it's not the man of sin who performs the false signs and wonders to lead astray the world. Uh, rather, it says that they're empowered by Satan. And so Revelation 13 as well gives us the satanic trinity, which is the beast, the false prophet and the image of the beast all three of which are empowered by Satan. So you even have a kind of counterfeit three and one or one in three. And so it's just something to, to kind of ponder, at least for me. It's not something that I'm going to die on a hill over, as I've said. Um, but I think sometimes in our Bible prophecy circles, we focus too much on the first beast when Revelation 13 clearly teaches two that work together. Um, and we kind of ignore the false prophets sometimes, I think. Anyway, um, John does not major on the Antichrist himself. 
uh, but rather he points the attention of his readers to the many current antichrists, specifically in verse 19 when he says that they went out from us, but they were not of us. Uh, this verse is most often used as a proof text against those who leave the faith. So most recently, you may have know, you may have read this, that um, a man named Paul Maxwell, who had contributed blogs and articles to John Piper's Desiring God website, has sort of renounced his faith and left Christianity. Um, so he was like, he'd gone through Bible college, had degrees, wrote for a conservative website, and now he's left the faith. Uh, and so people normally apply 1 John 2.19 to people like Paul Maxwell, but I don't think that's accurate because technically he's not a false teacher trying to infiltrate the church and lead people astray, rather he's just like left. The problem for John's audience was not those who were leaving, but the wolves who were coming in amongst the sheep. The phrase they went out from us is best understood as these false teachers who proceeded from the apostolic group in Jerusalem and then they used that as a badge of honour and authenticity to gain an audience. Uh, in a modern sense someone could learn and train at the best bible college in the world and still turn out to be a heretic but they could use the creden credentials of look at me I was you know best bible baptist college um, to, they could use that to draw in unsuspecting people. And so these people were circuit preachers. They were originally from Jerusalem. And this seems to be supported by 2 John verses 7 to 10, where the apostle writes and tells them not to host these people who are antichrists. And so having warned against love in the world, John now begins to warn against false teachers. And this brings us up to verse 20. Uh, the unction in verse 20 is the same word as anointing in verse 27. And the section shows us the importance of true doctrine and that doctrine has a bearing on fellowship. The emphasis in the section is on the relationship of the father and the son, which is really the central doctrine that is attacked by all cults. Uh, verse 22 tells us that the one who denies the father and the son is Antichrist. And verse 24 tells us to continue in that which we heard from the beginning um, and to continue or abide in the son. So abide in true doctrine and thus don't be deceived. That's kind of the point of the section. If you have been led astray into false doctrine regarding the person of the son, then you are out of fellowship. You can't have fellowship with someone if you're believing the wrong things about them. If you're denying, for instance, the hypostatic union. Uh, the promise related to abiding in verse 25, um, it says uh, is eternal life. This is a promise he has promised us, even eternal life. You know, contextually, it's again, it's not salvation or justification in view, but it refers to a quality of life, um, an abundant life. Uh, John 10.10 10 says that Christ came to give us life and to give it to its full, um, to paraphrase. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.12 to lay hold on eternal life. Then he spends several verses giving him exhortations and exhortation to his readers um, to work for things that are eternal and then in verse six uh, chapter six verse 19 he says to Timothy that they may hold up, uh, may that they may lay hold to eternal life and so Paul wanted Timothy and the church that Timothy was pastoring to lay hold on eternal life this was not an exhortation to get saved Paul clearly believed that Timothy and his hearers were believers but to live in fellowship with God so that they would grow and progress and gain eternal reward. Uh, we noted as we looked through this passage last time that the anointing actually is most likely a reference to the word of God, um, although most pe people take it as a reference to the Holy Spirit. Um, I'm not going to explain that anymore this week, but you can go and check the, the past teachings if you are interested. Uh, in verse 28, we have a reference to the rapture with the focus upon the beamer seat. So the believer can either have confidence or shame when Christ comes. And this is dependent upon our abiding or not abiding in Christ. Uh, verse 29 is not a proof text that a believer automatically practices righteousness, but rather it simply states that only a believer can practice righteousness. So a believer has two natures. We have the new nature. We are a new creation in Christ, but the old sin nature remains too. Thus, righteousness is only produced by the new nature 
Our sin nature can't produce righteousness. So only someone born of God can produce true righteousness. So it's saying only Christians can produce righteousness, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all Christians automatically produce righteousness. Now, as we begin chapter three, um, we see in the first two verses that we are called sons of God. And this is quite fitting considering the last verse of chapter two says that we are born of God. Uh, verse two also completes the thought contextually of where chapter two, verse 28 picked up with the rapture and the beamer. In chapter three, verse two, we're told that we will be like him when he appears. And this is a common theme in many rapture passages. There's uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 54. There's 2 Corinthians 5 verses 1 to 4, which talks of our um, mortality being swallowed up of immortality. There's Philippians 3, 20 and 21, which talks about Christ coming and changing our vile body. And so verse 2 um, is, a, is explaining what happens to us in our bodies when Christ appears. And then verse 3 calls this doctrine, calls the doctrine of the rapture um, a purifying hope. And verses 4 to 10 are a difficult section, they're a hard section to interpret accurately. We have a definition of sin in verse 4, which is transgression of the law. And then verse 5 gives us a clear statement that Christ came to take away our sins and ends with the statement, in him is no sin, emphasising his impeccability. And so we are given the we we when we're born again we're given the nature that we we're given a nature that comes from God, we're given Christ's righteousness. Verse six is where it gets difficult. So firstly, we've got this phrase "abiding." Whosoever abides in Him sins not. As as we've seen, abiding is something a believer might do, but also might not do. So whilst a believer is abiding, they will not sin. We need to stop abiding before we sin, if that makes sense. Uh, the second half of the verse is often taken to refer to an unbeliever who has never seen or known God. But we've already seen earlier on that Philip, who was a believer, was said to have been with Christ and yet not known him. Uh, thus, knowing and seeing here are terms related to intimacy and fellowship, not to salvation. And this is consistent with the context of the book as well as the next two verses in this specific passage. Again, in verse seven, it says, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he, that is Christ, is righteous. We're born again, we're born of God. So um, in our nature is uh, reflective of his. Um, it also then goes on to say in verse eight, that the one who sins is of the devil. So again, on the surface reading, this is often viewed as relating to unbelievers, comparing saved people with unsafe people. Uh, but last time we looked in many places in the epistles and in the book of Acts, where Satan influences believers. He is said to have filled the heart of Ananias. Uh, Paul wrote to the Ephesians and told them not to give Satan a foothold. And Christ actually called Simon Peter Satan. Uh, the point of these verses is... Uh, not saved people or unsaved people, but rather are Christians walking according to their new nature or to their old nature. The new nature cannot produce sin. It only produces righteousness. It can't produce sin because it originates from God and in him is no sin. But believers can walk in darkness. They can be out of fellowship and thus walk according to the old nature, which is the sin nature. And when doing so, they act like children of the devil which is a, quite a, a, a truth that kind of hits home quite hard in that when we're sin, we're actually manifest, manifesting the character of Satan and not the character of Christ. In verse 9, again, it can be misinterpreted. Some take it as a proof text of sinless perfection, uh, which it clearly isn't because that would contradict uh, 1 John 1, 8, which we've already looked at earlier. Uh, to sort of counter that problem, some say that this he refers to habitual sin or continuing in sin. Um, the problem is that the text doesn't say that. If we call this habitual sin in, in 1 John 3, 9, then we're committing eisegesis, we're reading something into the text that isn't there to try to solve a theological problem. And we shouldn't play games with the text just because a passage is difficult for us. It's not the right way to handle scripture. Uh, the rest of verse 9 
goes on to say that his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And so again, it's not saying that the person who is born again or the person who is saved never sins, but rather it emphasises uh, that sin does not originate from a person's, from a believer's new nature. There is no sin in Christ, there's no darkness in God, and so that which God births also has no sin. We sin because we still have the old nature, but one day this will be completely removed. And when Christ appears, we shall be like him. Only our new regenerate nature will remain, which is the new creation in Christ Jesus. Verse 10 indicates that it is a person's actions that is a test by which we judge whether they are a child of God or of the devil. And again, if children of the devil refers to unbelievers, how could they be commanded to love their brethren in Christ <clears throat> in the same verse? Clearly, it's a reference to believers because only believers our brothers. This then um, begins a new section from verse 11 onwards, which is a test of love. Uh, it transitions into the next section of whether or not we will love one another or hate one another. <coughs> we are given a negative example first in verse 12. It says, not as Cain. Cain slew his brother, and we studied the passage in Genesis 4 several months ago. Uh, these real-life blood brothers are used here as an example for how brothers in Christ should not behave towards one another. So we shouldn't be like Cain. Uh, verse 13 equates Cain with the world, and as Cain hated Abel, likewise the world will hate us. And then we come to verse 14. It says, we know we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He that loves not his brother abides in death. Now, again, it's one of those verses that plucked out of the context of the whole book um, can appear to be talking about um, a test of true salvation. No, we can know that we've passed from death to life, as in be saved because we love the brethren. And, and I've seen that on lots of blogs. Well, ways to have assurance. Are you loving the brethren? Um, and it's misapplied. The term abides in death is also taken to be, hey, that's an unsafe person. But this is contrasted to the earlier exhortations to abide in Christ or to abide in the light or to abide in his word. Thus, passing from death to life is not being saved, but it's moving from darkness to light, moving from death to life, moving from being out of fellowship to in fellowship. We're walking in light instead of walking in darkness. So it is possible for a believer to abide in death, to abide um, outside of fellowship with the Lord, to abide outside of the filling of the Spirit. And this leads us into verse 15, and again we have the phrase brother, so we know that Christians are being addressed. Um, hate in verse 15 is equated to murder. Uh, last time we spent a bit of time looking at some other scriptures to show that it is possible for a Christian to hate their brother, and it is even possible for a Christian to commit murder. David, whilst technically not a Christian, um, but he was a believer, committed murder in the case of Uriah. Also, 1 Peter 4.15 says, let none of you suffer as a murderer, which means that it is possible for a Christian to be a murderer. Um, eternal life in 1 John 3.15 is not salvation, but is again a reference to quality of life, the abundant life um, that is spoken of. So whoever hates his brother is a murderer. They're murdering in their heart. <clears throat> and the no murderer, which is someone hating their, their brother, has eternal life abiding in them. They are out of fellowship with the Lord. Um, not only that, we saw, uh, I didn't touch on it this time through, but back in verse 2 of the, the opening of the book, um, it says, For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. And so eternal life in this context was with the Father, and it's speaking of a person. So in that context, in 1 John 1, 2, eternal life is a reference to Christ. And so it could be the same thing here in the um, eternal life in verse 15 could also be a reference to Christ in that Christ is not abiding in us whilst we're abiding in sin. Um, 
Whereas verse 12 presented Cain as the negative example, verse 16 presents Jesus as the positive example. So Christ laying down his life for us is the greatest act of love that has ever been shown. And we are exhorted to act in the same way. We are to love in the way that Christ loved us. Verse 17 is a practical test. Do we meet the needs of those who have needs when it's within our power to do so? Uh, I think that in the West, we are all at least almost or somewhat capable of giving something or sharing something or meeting someone's needs somewhere. Even if we, we don't have the financial means, we often have the time. So verse 18 shows us that words are not good enough. It's not good enough to simply say, I hope God meets your needs and I will pray for you when it's within your power to meet a specific need. It's not always within our power to meet every need, but it's often within our power to meet a need somewhere. By demonstrating love, we assure our hearts before the Lord and the focus now shifts to prayer. In verse 20, we're told that if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. Uh, that means that we can trust him. We can remind ourselves of who he is and what he's done. And we can stand on the promises of verses like 1 John 1 9 and know that in confessing sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us. Whilst God gives grace to the weak and to the guilty of heart, verse 21 shows us that it is better to have confidence towards God and that we know our prayers will be heard and answered because we keep his commands and please him. Back near the start of chapter two, keeping his commands was equated with keeping his word. And this is done through abiding in him. Thus, the abiding Christian can be a confident Christian in the prayer closet. Verse 23 is in the context of confidence in prayer. And we compared this to the upper room discourse before where Christ told his disciples that from now on, they should pray and ask for things in his name. Before this time, people would not have prayed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Christ in the upper room discourse is laying down a church age truth for the disciples that he's about to leave. And so he's saying from now on. You are to pray and to ask for things in my name. Uh, finally, as we get to verse 24, uh, we're simply told that if we abide in him, uh, or rather that we do abide in him, if we keep his commands, um, and we also know that we abide in him because he has given us his spirit. And I think last time, back in December, we made a start into the early verses of chapter four, but we're going to leave it here for this evening. I know that's been quite a, a lot of information, but hopefully it's a bit of a recap and then next week we'll take it a lot more slowly and we'll look at the, the opening verses of chapter four again and, and probably get down to verse six. So.